there is a long and somewhat shameful history of asking who is responsible for the death of Jesus and then committing rather atrocious and horrible crimes on those supposedly guilty. The only thing to say about that shameful history is that it is shameful that crimes committed in that way are among the most heinous and that our Lord himself said, forgive them for they know not what they do and remaining somewhat silent about who it is that required that forgiveness. So let's put aside the lingering and sad history of anti-Semitism that associates the passion and say it has no place in any civilized world. When we look at the cross, we often think of it as a thing for us to look at. Abide with me, says, hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes, whether in sleep or in death. Jesus himself invited us to do this, likening himself lifted up to the serpent that Moses had made lifted up on a pole that the people would look to when they were bitten by a snake and be cured. But there's another way to see the cross as something held up to be looked at. The one who does the looking is God. It is God who is the main looker at the cross, not us. We are, if anything, bystanders, perhaps like the centurion whispering under our breath, wow, this really should not have happened. When God looks at us and smiles, perhaps, at our human foibles, God sees only the face of Christ. When God looks at us, God sees the face of Christ and loves us bearing that likeness. This is not only a metaphor. Paul drives this home over and over again. In our lesson telling the Philippians to have the same mind as Christ, not a mind similar to the mind of Christ. No, he says the same mind as Christ. And in the letter to the Romans, Paul tells us that the old creation, Adam, has been made new with a new creation, Christ. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Adam, the common humanity we all bear, in a world filled with violence and sadness and grief, and yes, joy and pleasant things too. In that whole complicated and mixed up world, that is Adam. And then in Christ, there is a new creation. And if it means anything, it is that we become new and we bear the likeness of Christ. And then when God looks at us, God sees only the face of his son. Behind the crucifix, see I am making all things new. All things. We have a great deal of trouble taking God seriously when God says things like this to us.
I am making all things new. The old has passed away, it is gone. It has no power over us. And God sees with God's tender eye of compassion his own dear son whenever he looks at us. There is nothing for us to do. It is not, not that we should somehow get our moral house in order and then God will look at us like God looks at his perfect son because we will have become perfect. It is not that God transforms us into perfect people so that God can then look at us like God looks upon his son. It is that we already bear the likeness of Christ. God now, today, looks at each of us and sees only the face of Christ. Behind those doors is an image of the new and resurrected Christ striding forward on the move, trampling a thistle. The thistle is the symbol of death. Never mind that artichokes are delicious and thistles are beautiful flowers. <laughs> In art, things have to, have to have a little bit of flexibility. The thistle is the symbol of death. It is the symbol of what needs to be trodden underfoot. But it's not future tense, it's past tense. A monk of the Society of St. John the Evangelist, where Father Mark often goes to visit, once told me that he was in an airport in civilian dress and someone came up to him and asked if he was saved. And he said, yes. And the person said, when? Probably wanting to verify that he had been saved in the proper way. And the brother said, at about 3 p.m. on the first Good Friday, That's when, when God looks at each one of us, he sees only the face of his dear son. To absorb that is hard. It's hard because we have trouble taking God at God's word when God says such things. It's even harder when we look at the face of those around us to remember that when God looks at that person in the next car on the freeway, God sees only the face of his dear son. When God looks at a homeless man, God sees only the face of his dear son. When God looks at a convicted murderer on death row, God sees only the face of his dear son. When God looks at the victim of a terrible crime, God sees only the face of his dear son. When God looks at the perpetrator of that crime, God sees only the face of his dear son. It's mighty hard for us to live into that reality. And when it's hardest to live into it in ourselves, maybe then is the time to look at the person in the next car who has just cut you off on the freeway and say, thank you, God, for putting one more image of your dear son into my life. And one day, we will see him face to face and we will become incapable of seeing each other as anything other again than the image of his dear son. We will see a landscape with that wonderful river 
the one we have gathered at, the one where Christ is on the move, strewn with trampled thistles and one humanity.